Okay, so um, like Wesley said, Brian and I are going to talk about kind of debugging processes and you know tips, tricks, um, what we do, what might help. So um, you know we'll kind of progressively get into more and more detail and advanced things, um, but just kind of want to get a lot of information out there for those of you who are actually, you know, particularly if you're actually doing code development and modification, but even things like changing inputs, um, changing case definitions um, can cause unforeseen problems. And it's important to kind of understand how to, how to address those. So the, the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is just kind of give sort of an overview of like where to look and some basics. Um, and then Brian and I have um, created a bunch of failed runs <laughs> to sort of walk through exactly what it would look like for, for those runs. Um, so I guess I'll just start with one as an example. So one of the first things that, um, so like the first thing that you want to do if you have a, when you finish a run, probably, um, first thing is to kind of like look in the outputs folder. If it's empty, that's bad, right? Um, so there should be a bunch of CSV files, some GAMS GDX files, a couple HTML outputs. And if you don't see that, that's you know an obvious red flag. Um, the first thing, you know, there are different orders you can do things, but kind of like the, the first thing to potentially look at is the GAMS log. Uh, I'm gonna actually just go to a run that I know worked from my internal repository to, uh, you know, just kind of like give an example of what a good good one looks like. So if you don't open up the GAMS log, this is basically what gets printed out in your command window. You can walk through and look at all the processes that get involved, you know, runs some, you know, initial switch settings, B inputs, this is all your input processing, um, kind of goes down. But essentially, if this works, you know, um, this is just some Python output stuff that doesn't look like it worked quite right. But, you know, if it works, everything looks good. It goes all the way down to the reporting, finishes that off. Um, one of the things that I like to do pretty often is to do a quick search for the LP status. So this is going to tell you how each of the optimizations completed for each of the model years. So you can just kind of go down. This is like a not great, but acceptable message. Um, we have these sometimes just because uh, you know the model is very large and highly constrained. And particularly in some of these earlier solves, we'll see these unscaled feasibilities. Um, but that's not really an indication of like a, a necessarily a bad solution. But really what you want to see is you know optimal all the way down. Uh, for all of your solve years. And if you see something different, you might see infeasible, you might see time limit exceeded. Um, if, if you do see it say infeasible on one of the LP statuses, um, you can search for infeasibility, but as you can see, like it might pick up all these where it's actually going through part of the solution procedure. Um, in which it's, you know, starting with a slightly infeasible solution and tweaking it in order to achieve feasibility, which is what it does at the end of the solve. Um, another thing you could uh, search for, uh, how's that spelled? Is to look at the year if you want to get to like kind of the top of the solve, yeah, I was looking for this. So you can search for current year, which as you'll see, if there's going to be a infeasibility, it's probably going to show up near the top of the solve for a given thing in this section where it's actually running this LP pre-solve. So I'll show some of that later. So these are just ways to use the GAMS log file to figure out um, where an error uh, might might occur. Generally, you just go to the end, see where it stopped, and then kind of go from there. 
And once you know where it stopped, then you generally know what list file to look for the actual error. So the next thing you do is go into this list files folder and say it stopped at 2020. You can then, or actually first, let's say it stopped before it even ran any model years. The first thing it's gonna do is, well, first of all, it'll only have this input stat list file in here. And what you do is just open up the list file um, in whatever way you want and search for four asterisks. Um, that's GAMS's kind of text code to indicate an error. And here, you know, it just goes right to the end to the summary because this one worked. But um, that's what you're going to do is essentially search for that and then look for the error messages that that occur. And, and we'll again show lots of examples of that. And once you find the error message, then you can start to figure out, then you can open up whatever code um, is associated with where the error occurred, be that the inputs file, the model file. Um, it's like in a lot of cases, it's probably gonna be the, the inputs file in, in at least some of the kind of basic things you might be modifying to, to run the model. Um, but again, you know, it could obviously be in the supply model, it could be in supply objective, um, any of these things, depending on where you're changing um, the code or where you're adding new parameters. So GAMS log, list files, search for four asterisks, that'll tell you where to find the code snippet that's causing a problem and go in and, and edit that. Um, the one other thing that I did want to mention is um, Augur. So if you are, there is, it's, it, I feel like it's probably unlikely that most users are going to try to manipulate Augur, which is, you know, the side module that does an 8760 dispatch over seven years and calculates like curtailment, renewable capacity credit. But there is an off chance that you know, you change something somewhere else that then goes gets fed into Augur and then causes an error in Augur. In Augur. Um, just to mention, if that does happen, um, you will see a text file in here that is labeled Augur errors and whatever year it had an error. Um, chances are it'll happen in the first year that it runs Augur, which is by default 2020, and this will get spit out if there is an error in there. And it'll tell you um, essentially, you know, this is a Python error output and it'll tell you kind of where to find, uh, it'll help you figure out where to find and address that error. Don't want to spend a lot of time on how to fix Augur errors, um, but it, it, can, it can be done. Um, you generally use this file to understand sort of where the, which Augur file the error occurs, and then you can kind of back out, like, you know, what, obviously which line of code it's showing up. And um, one other thing to point out, and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you can run Augur independently if you do need to address an Augur error. Um, a lot of us like to use Visual Studio Code because it's kind of convenient um, for that. Um, but if you do want to run Augur independently, just a couple quick things. Like you want to start with this augur.python file and you essentially want to you know, run all of your imports and then start stepping through manually the code up until the point where you had the error. Um, so here you, you can see all the different calls of you know, GDX sum, curtailment, marginal curtailment, um, Condor does storage arbitrage value. So like in this case, um, I could run Augur through this marginal curtailment file, and then I could open up um, the marginal curtailment file and step through that, um, you know, like running individual cells and um, being able to then see what, what actually Python is doing, look at parameters and data frames as they're being manipulated throughout the code and better identify like exactly what's going on and what's what's broken. And just a couple things with that is, 
you will have to do things. And there's a lot of messages in, in Augur that say like to debug, uncomment these lines. Um, and so you'll have to manually define a bunch of parameters to get that to work. You might have to skip like some of these definition statements. Um, again, like I, we don't, I don't plan on doing this as an example, but um, just want to point out that if you do start playing around and have auger errors, like it is possible to kind of run these files independently, um, either from a run folder or from your core directory and, and address things there. And, you know, there are also individual list files for the Osprey runs. So these potentially have error output if that occurs in that hourly dispatch optimization. Um, so that's another place to potentially look. Uh, and then another thing you can look through if you have outputs is, um, actually, I think it's back in our data. Oops, wrong one. If you go into the auger data, you'll also see lots of other stuff that gets um, exported throughout the auger process. And you can look at these. Um, so like reads data is essentially the data after the read solve that gets put into auger. And you can look and again, see if these parameters look as you expect. Um, and you know various other stages of the process. Um, Augur is kind of a complicated beast, but just want to point out some of these locations to get you started. And, you know, if you do run into problems with it, um, these are the places you would look for different um, information on, on what's going on. Um, so those are a few places to kind of like look for different error um, issues. A few other kind of thoughts, tips and tricks, you know, a lot of cases, you might just be manipulating inputs, right? And so like the first thing to look if you're doing anything on the input side is, I mean, you know, obviously if you run the model and it fails, go to GAMS log, go to inputs.lst. But it's one of the things that if it gets far enough and it gets through the inputs, starts running the model, it's always good to check your an inputs.gdx file. Um, again, I'll just go back to this because this is like an actual run that went through. But inputs case has all of the possible inputs, the, all the inputs that go into the model, um, not all the possible ones, what gets brought over for that run. Um, but it always has this inputs.gdx. And this is a great file to look at because it's essentially just an unload of everything that exists after all of the input processing. So this is what the model is actually seeing. And you can go into one of these and you know look at any parameter and just check it, you know, make sure there's nothing weird going on. There's no like zeros, not a numbers. Um, things are filled in that you think is gonna get filled in and, and so on, you know, obviously, especially if you're like adding something new, you can just check and see if it's there. Um, and that's always really, you know, I, I think it's good practice to do that no matter what, if you're manipulating inputs. Um, a few things that like, if you get, weird behaviors, a couple of parameters. Uh, if you get weird behaviors like things aren't getting built that you think should be able to get built, um, maybe you tried to add a technology and it's not showing up, um, key parameters to look for, look at that kind of issue is these val um, parameters. So these are saying respectively, what capacity is valid, um, what technology combinations are valid to be able to generate electricity, what technologies are va valid for being invested in, just built at all as new builds, what are valid for retirements. And so like a lot of these, these matrices can be really useful just to make sure like there's no barrier for, like preventing it from even being considered in the model um, for you know generation or investment and so like if I add a technology and I'll just reset this you know and it doesn't show up in here at all like if I look down the technology list then that's a problem right and so then you know to go into the inputs um, and start to work through kind of like how this 
parameter is defined and why your technology is not showing up. So these are these are useful to look at if you have kind of issues with like something is getting built that shouldn't or is not getting built that should. Um, one other helpful procedure um, is to add unload statements. And so like if you added something that changes how any parameter is calculated, um, it's really easy to just go into here Um, you know, say I changed this, how this was done, I could just unload it here. And once I run this, then it'll have the separate GDX file that um, includes just that parameter and it's easy to look at. Sometimes I'll even do stuff like this where I'll be like, you know, before and after a change, then you can see like exactly what's going on. Because, you know, unlike stuff like Python and MATLAB, whatever, you can't like do this real time in GAMS, which is one of the more annoying features of GAMS or lack of features. But this is a way to, you know, parse out kind of like what exactly is going on at different stages of, of calculation. Um, so that's a useful thing to do in a lot of cases. Um, what else? Uh, another thing, um, and this kind of gets more into like if you have. Um, a solution or it got part of the way and you wanna see what's going on. So like similar to inputs.gdx, we actually have, um, I'll go back to the open access repo since that's what y'all can see right away or right now. But like we actually have this really nice little mini batch file called dump all data. And it's just a couple lines of code all it does is it runs this dump all data got dot gams that is just an execute unload statement um, without a parameter listing. And you know when you do execute unload without a parameter listing, it dumps everything. And so if you do that using a restart file, um, and you can change this to whichever restart file you have, it's just going to spit out everything that the model knows about at that time. And so that can be really helpful to really inspect like, you know, not only parameters that are input, but also variables, um, equations, and take a look at, you know, really everything that's, um, that the model sees. So that's a good sort of, and these files can get really big, so you don't want to like do it all the time and keep it around, but that's, can be really useful, again, for inspecting um, what's going into the model and, and addressing errors. Um, what else? And just in case um, you're a little bit unfamiliar with the save files to begin with, they all get stored in this folder here. Um, this is one of my purposeful fa failed runs. So there's no nothing in there, but like here, for example, um, you know, there's one without a year, and that's the one that's associated with the inputs. So you can always like restart from after it ran all the inputs, um, but then you'll get a goo file for whatever the last year was that got, um, that ran. One thing to note is since these get very large, like this is a tiny test run, but these can get to many hundreds of megabytes. And so by default, we have them get removed once you move on to the next year. Um, but if you wanted, you could um, change that. So one of the you know good ways to troubleshoot if you have a solution that goes part of the way and then fails, it's like you are potentially able to restart intermediately if you have the right save file. So like you can go into the batch file. So in any run folder, you've got um, a batch file, a call batch file that's associated with that run. And it is, it's really just what's printed out by this run batch.py that you call when you run the model. And it steps through, you know, all the procedures and all the GAMs and Python calls as you go. And so like, if I had a run that failed after 2014, I'm gonna have the 2012 save file. And if I wanted to restart, like I could just go up here, comment all of everything leading up to that, save it, 
and then when I, you know, double click, this is a different one, but you know, when I double click the call file again, it'll just, you know, start right here. So you might do this if you wanted to like test something um, that you change, but keep in mind, once it's compiled all of the code in create model.gams, like changing the B inputs file isn't gonna do anything here. Like you'd have to start from scratch. Um, but if for some reason you do need to restart a run, this is how, how you would go about doing it. Uh, and again, you need to make sure that you're attaching the right save file. And then like, if you wanted to rerun from the start and keep all of the save files, you could go in and, um, actually, does this not have a delete? Yeah, okay, these things. So like, these are the statements where it's saying, you know, before it, where it's deleting the last year's um, goo files. So you can always go in if you really want to keep them all around and just comment out all of these things uh, and run again. And, and every once in a while I'll do that because, you know, I want to be able to look at everything because then you could dump all data for every single solve year, look at everything um, and fill up your hard drive. Um, you can also, you know, potentially depending on where you are and you can also, you know, copy and paste these directly in the command line and run it, run it from there. Um, one other good practice um, that I'll mention is that we do include in the cases, we do include this cases test file, um, if it'll open. Okay, maybe it won't open. Um, let's try this. Well, that's weird. Uh, we can joke, we have IT issues where we can't um, use Excel and we have to use this thing instead. And doesn't work as well. Um, anyway, so we have this test cases file that you know is some settings to run just ERCOT. Um, and this is useful to run if you are, if you want a small model that you can test things out on. So just want to mention that. The last thing before I turn it over to Brian to start with our kind of like demonstrations is um, just want to talk a little bit about semantic errors, which, you know, essentially is when there's no compile error, it runs, you look at the solution, and it doesn't make any sense for one reason or another. And, you know, I, I think some of this is like common sense, but it's easy to believe that you did it right. <laughs> when even when it, especially when it's something you think is really simple. Um, but Breeze is a big model and it's really easy to make small changes that have kind of branching <laughs> ramifications elsewhere. And so it really is important to think about like everything that is possibly involved with the one parameter that you change. And so like if I, you know, I don't know, change something about CO2 capture rates and now nothing's working right, like you probably should go and look and do like a find files of everywhere this thing is used. Um, you know, okay, well that goes into this parameter and this parameter, look and see what those look like. Maybe you need to do the same thing. Let's search for, you know, capture rate fuel. Where does that show up? And, you know, kind of go down the line. And so these sort of like, meandering paths of parameter definitions can be really important to do to make sure that you know you understand exactly how, how things are being calculated and figure out you know what might be causing an error um, some other stuff that can cause weird behaviors is like if you see some really extreme thing happen like one technology takes over like maybe you accidentally created a negative cost in the objective function. So you might think about how things trace to the objective function. 
Um, but I mean, these are always tricky, right? Because like the model doesn't the model doesn't necessarily abort. Um, even if there's like an infusibility, sometimes it'll just like try the next year, and you know, so you don't always get immediate information. I think some of the I think the more recent version, Wesley, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We actually do have it abort, um, so that'll change in the next version. But um, you know, it's important to carefully look at your outputs, you know, the GAMS log file, because it there might be a problem that you don't notice because it just keeps running. Um, so like, you know, check for it saying there's an infusibility um, or if it's like unbounded, that's another thing you could see if you have a negative cost. Um, you know, it's tricky because sometimes you'll have a neg if you have like a negative cost show up, make something ridiculously attractive, it won't necessarily be unbounded because there'll be some other constraint on it somewhere else. Um, so it'll solve just fine, but you'll just see like, I don't know, like landfill gas is 90% of the generation, you know, <laughs> something weird like that could happen. Um, another thing to keep an eye out for is if you look at any prices and they have zero values, that generally means that, um, you, you know, you might have like a generation mix that looks reasonable, but then all of your electricity prices and capacity prices are zero. Um, that often happens if you run times out which you know, may or may not be an issue depending on what you're doing. But what happens is it'll get a primal solution that's pretty close to feasibility and optimality. Then it'll try to reconcile that with the dual solution. It won't be able to, it'll spend hours and hours. And so since it doesn't have a dual solution, it doesn't have marginals, thus it doesn't have prices. Um, and so if you see zero prices on stuff, it probably means that something like that happened where it, it couldn't complete the the full dual solution and the full optimization. So that's just something to like keep an eye out for. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is if you've gone through everything, you've been banging your head against the wall for days, um, one more advanced thing that you can do if you want is to do what's called write out the, the MPS file. And to do that, you can just go into the options file that gets called every solve and this is something you can do intermediate, right? So again, like if you're restarting, you can change this um, potentially intermediately. And you can just say like, um, let's see, what's the exact code? I wrote this over here. If you just write something like this into your options file, um, it's gonna output this file that you can open up in like GAMS IDE and it's essentially going to be like a gigabyte file that includes the entire um, LP matrix. So it's going to have all your coefficients, all your constants, and you can search for individual constraints, variables, whatever, um, to sort of trace around like, like in its most pure form, like what exactly is the optimization model seeing. And so this is very cumbersome, but it can be you know, like a last resort if you really can't understand what's getting calculated. Because then it tells you like, this is the coefficient that's going on this variable. Um, does that look the right magnitude, the right sign, all of that stuff. Um, so that's like something that finally you can look at. But anyway, I've probably already taken up too much time. That's sort of like my whirlwind overview of like a lot of things to think about and look at with um, error checking, but I'm gonna turn it over to Brian now. And Brian, you can start to give some examples. Cool, thanks Stuart. Let's see. And also if you have like other things that you think I missed, <laughs> chime in on there too. I'll put a few things in the chat. Uh, so. Oh, cool, good. I don't know, do folks have questions before we proceed to next stage? Yeah, no, that was kind of a lot, but I, you know, I want to, it's a lot I want to get through in the amount of time. Okay, well, I'll just go through maybe applied, uh, applying some of the tactics Stuart just mentioned for a couple of um, maybe not uncommon errors. Um, so one I wanted to start with is um, missing Python package. So we have a bunch of Python scripts that do processing uh, at the 
start before GAMS gets uh, initiated, then also at the ends to do some processing. If you don't have one of the appropriate Python packages, those scripts might fail. Um, and that can sometimes be hard to trace. So I have an example here where I ran a case uh, and it failed. You can see uh, if we follow Stuart's tips, right? There's nothing in the outputs folder. So, you know, I might go to the GAMS log next. Um, here I go to the ends and it looks like create model had a compilation error. Uh, since that's a GAMS file, um, I might check out this list files folder since they often have, if you have a, a GAMS compilation error, that's where you'd find it. So here, uh, do just what Stuart was saying with searching for these asterisks. And this quickly flags that this Python script failed. So this error, um, if we go to the bottom, will basically has this error code says abort triggered by above statement. That's pretty vague, but in the context of Python scripts, that just basically means this Python script failed for some reason and GAMS didn't know how to handle that failure. So it just ends. Um, and so what I'll typically do from here is kind of what Stuart was describing, which is to run one of these scripts as a standalone and just to try to test out um, what's going on in that script. Um, and so you can use this call statement uh, typically to um, get at uh, basically kind of direct information on what that looks like. So Stuart was saying you could open up the Python script, kind of reconfigure it to debug, but often I'll just take this kind of text and, you know, this has the list of input parameters, for instance. Um, so this is exactly what gets called. Um, so here I will go to the runs folder. Uh, let me just see what this is. So now I'm in the same uh, place that the run is occurring and I'll enter this super long command, which has a bunch of path names and arguments and I'll try to run it. And it's thinking about it. And then it pops back with this error, right? So this basically quickly pinpoints the fact that I'm, this Python script thinks it needs this H5 pi package. And in this current environment, I don't have it installed. So to rectify this, you would basically go and install this Python package. I think many of you may be are using Conda, but the way we would do this is just a Conda install. Um, in the upcoming version of reads, we now will include a reads environment, like a Conda environment that we would very highly recommend folks use because it basically has information on all the required packages that you would need to uh, run a reads run. And so there'll be information on generating that, but it's basically an environment.yml file, which has all the package information. You can create this reads environment. And every time you do a run, if you activate that environment, it should be consistent and you should have all the, the Python packages you need. Um, so that's at least future looking. I think in the meantime, if folks are using the open access one, you can use this approach to kind of identify missing packages. Um, and certainly if you wanted kind of advanced access to that environment file, we, I think we'd be happy to share at least that piece. Although some of those packages might be tied to versions of the Python scripts that will be coming out in the fall version and not necessarily aligned with the, the open access one. So that was a Python package issue. Does any, any folks have questions on that or run into kind of related problems that you'd wanna maybe ask more about? I guess, the other thing I'll flag is I've sometimes had weird errors where packages install poorly. Um, and sometimes it helps to just remove the package and reinstall or remove the environment and reinstall if you're getting errors that you really don't understand and can't figure out how to address. Um, that's helped me in the past. Um, and then I guess I'll maybe also uh, more preview for the upcoming version, but the upcoming version will have the Python input processing script called directly from the 
batch file or the uh, sh file uh, that you generate when you start a run, um, which I think will make it easier to kind of just pick off the, if you have a run fail in one of these input processing scripts, you can just run that kind of independently from that batch file and, and go from there. Um, so the next case I had was a B inputs error. Um, so once again, this is a failed run, no outputs. Uh, here, if we go to the GAMS log, we see it got further than before. It's working on B inputs, but compilation error is here. So that is a flag uh, that B inputs is, it fails in actually C supply. Um, but if we go to this input scripts, we can kind of trace it down from here. Uh, here are the error codes. We've got an una unable to include open file or open included file and then a unrecognizable item. Um, and just tracing these, like this is a issue where this file couldn't be read. In this case, there was a missing path information. So the file didn't work. Um, and then a very common GAMS issue um, here which sometimes can be hard to trace, but this basically is flagging, not recognizing the statement. And it turns out we're missing a semicolon at the end of this line above it. Um, and so it doesn't recognize what's going on there. So uh, pretty easy to fix those issues and then you could rerun uh, and that take care, takes care of that. So I think the input issues are not uncommon if you're doing model development. And so this is typically a good place to look. And I would just echo a lot of what Stuart said about um, looking into the inputs files if you can get generated, or if you're having trouble, maybe um, printing out intermediate inputs so you can take a look at values to make sure that they're uh, what you are expecting. And then another one I wanted to go over is um, e-reports. Um, so in this case, uh, we actually have a bunch of files. So you may think that this looks really good, but if you open these, you'll see that this says GDX file not found. So none of these actually have any data in them. Um, so your run hasn't hasn't worked in this case, uh, but this is a clear flag that something's wrong with the reporting script, which happens at the end of the, the model and dumps out the results. We can kind of verify that if we go here. Um, so you've got normal, normal completion actually in the dump script. Um, but if you go to the report script, you can see this compilation error issue. Um, and then if you look at the list files, you actually see this was a test run for ERCOT through 2030. So I have all, all the list files up through that. So that means the model kind of made it there, but this report uh, has an issue. It's this very surreptitious error that just says error in it that caused it to break. Uh, but a nice thing about errors in reporting scripts is that you don't actually have to rerun the whole model to get the outputs you want. Uh, and so in this case, I'm just going to stay in this run folder, but go find the reporting script, uh, which is right here. Go trace down this error, which is here. And if I remove it, now this script should be good to go. Uh, and then the next thing I'll do is, is basically go to this batch file. So I ran this on a Mac, so this is a SH, but if you ran this on a Windows, you'd have a, a dot batch, but I'll make a copy of this. Um, maybe rename it to something uh, simple. Just kind of call it reports. Uh, and then here, I'm going to basically cut out most of this. Basically, it failed in report, and I want it to just start with that report piece. So I've modified the script to get to the right folder and um, basically rerun that, that part. And so uh, I'm actually going to go over here. Sorry, this is a bad environment. Anyway, I will uh, run through this, but the moral of the story is um, you can basically run rerun this and then it's going to pick up with the reporting uh, piece 
So that saves you a bunch of times, uh, a bunch of time in not having to rerun. Um, so that was three of the main ones. I think Stuart, you have some, I have an auger error that I can go through, but I think we are gonna say that to the end. Um, so we weren't sure if that was gonna be uh, something people are interested in, right? Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I guess one of the things that, um, just to kind of piggyback on this a little bit, so just notice that this e-report call has a specific restart file. Um, if you want, you can run e-reports at any point with any restart file. So like if you have a run where you're telling it to keep all the restart files, like you could run reporting while it's still going on some intermediate year if you want to see like the nice HTMLs of like what the gen mix looks like in that year. So like that's another way to kind of check and make sure things are kind of like looking right or looking as you expect as you go along. Um, and yeah, and I think like the Python package thing, like that's fairly simple, but it's just a, important to show also that, you know, like you don't necessarily get the full error output if you have a problem in one of those input processing scripts. And so to actually know what the error is, you sort of have to do what Prind is, you know, kind of write, run it independently. Um, unlike what, unlike with the auger where we do have it set up to output that text file with the errors. Like if something happens to the input processing, you kind of just need to go and run those independently and, and see what's going on. Um, but yeah. All right, let me share again. So uh, first thing I'm gonna talk about is different issues involving the case file. So, um, you know, the cases file is used to specify all of your switch settings. Let me just do this, of which there are lots of different options, right? Like, I think it's kind of one of the best things about reads from a user standpoint is we just have like dozens and dozens of things you can play with um, in order to set up scenarios. Um, one of the downsides of that is that you know, we're, we're not like software developers that work on user experience. So there's not a lot of error checking involved in how the data in this spreadsheet gets used. And so it's frustratingly easy to change something in here ever so slightly one character off and cause your model, to, your run to fail, um, and then be really confused as to why that happens. So I created a few um, versions of that just to sort of show some different things that can happen. So like, here's a run, um, case error one, you know, obviously no outputs. Um, going again, you know, going to GAMS log, compilation error, um, file not found, battery. So this is an error that happened all the way up in a write data. Um, it actually does have some of the Python output here. Um, so this is actually kind of useful. So like what I did um, for, here's the cases file that I created for this run. It gets imported over. Um, let me. So all I did in here is I was like, oh, I want to use the mid case ATB costs from 2020. And, um, but, you know, it turns out um, that actually isn't a thing. So like when it, the way it uses this switch battery scenario is it's using it to define which file to pull cost and performance data for batteries um, when it does some of the input processing. And so if you go into the inputs into, uh, I think it's this one, yeah. Plant characteristics, you can see this is the list of available files. Oh no, the 2020 is called moderate, not mid, right? 2019 it was mid, 2020 it's moderate, 2021 it's moderate. And so again, this is like, all I did was just pick what I thought was a file and it created this error. So you'd have to, you know, obviously choose a correct thing. So that's one thing to, to think about that, um, if you're, especially if you're creating new alternatives, like say I wanna do my own custom battery, um, battery cost trajectories, you know, like you could open one of these up, you know, change these numbers however you want. And, you know, just whatever is you use in the switch setting has to, you know, be very exact. 
as to what um, what you choose. The one thing that I do want to also point out, however, uh, for an upcoming change in the newer version of reads, we're going to have an additional column in this case's file that um, I kind of love and hate, but it actually gives you the list of all possible options for some of these switches. And so in this case, um, here's battery scenario. It's got an NA in it in this choices column. That means that it doesn't, there's no restrictions. But if it's a switch that actually has a list of a specific set, like if you wanted to change coal prices, create your own. If you didn't also add like um, your new file name to this list, it wouldn't work. So, you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your head for the future. When the new version comes out, you now have this um, choices column to contend with in addition um, to what you would have before. So that's like one one possible error on that side. I'm going to keep this up. So another another one. Oops, too far. Case there are two. Um, again, you know, no outputs. Gams log terminated due to parameters. So this one's kind of a weird one, right? So like, let's see what list files do. It's got an inputs.list file. Um, search for the asterisks. So this is kind of weird, right? Like there's no error message. Um, so it's like, okay, hey, um, so what, what went on here? It's got all these like parameter, goes through this stuff. And then it's got, um, you know, all these weird parameter issues. This one is like a little tricky and annoying. Um, and you can kind of get at it if you dig a little bit deeper into these files. So it's trying to do, it's having an issue with these restart files, terminated due parameter issue errors. If I go into the restart files, it says t1 case.goo, but my run's called t1 case error two. And so the moral of the story is never use periods in your run names <laughs> in the cases file because it'll cause file path issues. Um, so just the way that these file names get created using this period, um, like all I did was just use a peer here. It's like, you know, a lot of times we might want to use that to separate parts of file names and like that can be okay and for some software, but not others. So, um, yeah, this is just a little thing to keep in mind. Hopefully, it saves somebody on the call a headache someday. Um, and then the last thing, like same thing with it doesn't, games doesn't like spaces either. If you put space in the name, it will also right not be happy. Yeah, so this is just an example of like again, we don't have a lot of error checking on this this kind of stuff, so it's it's important to watch out for it. And then the last one um, that I've got here is this error. So this one actually has compilation errors. And if you open up the list file, you can kind of do the standard procedure. Um, and this one's saying national gen frac. So it's got a 116 and a 170. So you know, the procedure is like, I always go here first. OK, here's the, the error codes are. It's happening at this national gen frac definition and then let's just go down label is unknown domain violation for element so this is a case where like um what i wanted to do uh was essentially run a scenario where 
there we go. I turned on essentially a clean energy standard and I wanted it to run this, this 80% by 2035 scenario. If I go into my inputs case, national gen frac, it's gonna, what that does is it tells you, that switch tells you which setting to pull from. Um, but it turns out that's not actually an entry in here, right? There's a whole lot of options. 80 by 2035 is not one of them. So this is, you know, basically just showing like it doesn't have that scenario. Um, and so it's gonna throw an error because it, it doesn't know where to find that information. One thing to also point out, however, is that say you add a column in there, um, you also, need to add it to this list. Um, so if you don't have, this is a list of all possible columns in here. And so for this particular one, this is sort of like another way of enforcing the finite number of choices. You've got you've to have, have it in the list as well. So again, these are all things that like, you know, all I did potentially was just change something in the case file and created a variety of different of errors. Um, a couple other things, I know we're running out of time, um, but I can stay on a little bit longer. I want to point out a couple infeasibility challenges. So infeasibilities are tough because you know you really need to track through like what's going on in the code and where they occur. Um, here's an example. Um, where um, I killed it here, but like one thing to flag in feasibility is like if you start to see it just like taking a long time and not really getting anywhere. But if I look at my LP status, um, first one works, then it's optimal, 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 then it's infeasible, um, and it figures this out at the pre-solve. And in this case, it's saying. This is the the better kind of infeasibility is when there's something involving a row. So it'll tell you which constraint is has a problem. Uh, and so I doctored this up, but it's saying like there's an issue with this constraint. And okay, well, let's go and find like what's let's copy this and um, really you'd probably want to go in the run, you know, you go in the run folder, you can search for this uh, and then say like, okay, well, here's the constraint. Um, it's saying that, you know, the investment's gotta be less than a, some absolute growth limit. In this case, it's easy because I actually changed this, but if I go look at growth limit absolute, like I wanted to run a scenario where you were really restricted in how much solar you could build in a year. And I set it at a thousand, where it's normally 16,575. Um, these constraints are also not on by default. And so what's happening is this is too restrictive, right? So like there's some other constraint, <clears throat> probably prescriptive builds that is trying to say you have to build solar more than a thousand. Um, in yet this other constraint is saying that you can't build that. So there's a conflict there. And so like these infusibility rows, like, you know, you find the constraint, um, you start to look at the parameters involved in that constraint, the variables and kind of go from there. Uh, so that's like one thing that can happen. The worst case <laughs> is um, for this scenario, what I actually did is I created a, actually this is gonna work because the other one, um, I wanted to create like a super ambitious, um, he's not opening anymore. I do not like the software very much. Oh boy, anyway. <laughs> 
I wanted to create like a really ambitious um, case for decarbonization. Uh, this isn't even the right one. So I created this same clean energy standard constraint, but I created a, put a column in there, added it to the code. It's 100% now. And so what that looks like, um, is starting in 2020, 100% <laughs> clean energy. Um, if I run that, And go to the GAMS log again. It just hit this point where it wasn't really going anywhere. Um, where it's infeasible in 2020 it shows up with a generation variable on batteries. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but like this is an example where this is tricky, right? I mean, like you can imagine, right? If it's if you're telling 100% clean energy by 2020, there's like some the system is too constrained by what exists to probably hit that right away. Um, but it's giving you instead of an infeasibility row, it tells you what constraint to look at. It's giving you a column. In this case, it's actually generate column means that you know variable. In this case, it's a generation variable, which technically means that the infeasibility could have to do with any constraint involving that variable. Um, so for generation variables, that means you've got a lot of constraints potentially to look at, um, or just think about, oh, this sounds like a kind of um, tough scenario to get to work. Let's try something else. Um, but this is an example where you might want to look at that MPS file, um, where you might actually create that MPS file look at all the coefficients on this generation variable and various constraints and see where where exactly it looks like things are conflicting. That's a pretty, you know, that's definitely a more advanced thing to do and I hope no one has to do that. But um, in feasibility column errors, I would argue are like some of the most difficult to address. Um, but I just wanted to point out sort of what that looks like. Okay, that was pretty quick on this stuff and we're already a little over, but does anybody have any questions on that? All right, Wesley, Brian, anything I missed? No, I think it's been good. Um, I mean, there's a lot more we could always cover, but uh, a lot of times, more helpful to have. I guess the summary: If you guys have questions with debugging something, you're you're welcome to throw them up on that discussion board, and then that way there'll be examples for people to look at and and work through. So uh, let me go stop recording. Take it away. I might have shared the wrong one, sorry. Right, so um, this is actually, so uh, this is error I got on the kind of current version of the model. So it's not the open access one that so we'll be yeah, publishing it soon. Um, also, I guess I'll just point out that our previous run rerunning e report worked and now we have outputs. So, yay. Um, but for this auger error, I, um, if we start kind of with the path, uh, outputs is actually weird in this case. We have no CSV files, but a bunch of um, plots. Um, but we don't have what we want, which is the actual outputs. So, flagging something is wrong. Um, GAMS log, get rid of these things, uh, is also interesting because it kind of finishes uh, without too much clear, uh, clear indication that there was an error. So I can't find like a compilation error statement in here, um, but we didn't get outputs. So we know something's up 
Um, here's where I would next check the list files folder. Um, and this is, uh, Stuart flagged this, but we've got this auger errors text file that will generate if auger has a problem. And in this case, we've got stuff in here. Um, so that means something went wrong in auger. Uh, this happened in the 2050 version. You can kind of tell by this flag, uh, this year attribute here, and also kind of intuiting that the, you know we have list files for the other ones, um, but it kind of stops at the end. Um, this ended up being kind of a tricky thing to debug. So I guess, spoiler alert, like most auger errors probably occur because something happened in reads that passed some data that was bad to auger. Uh, at least in my experience. And in this case, that was what happened. But working through it kind of took a few steps. Um, the next step I did here was to rerun Augur at this time step. And I did that kind of the similar way I was showing uh, folks earlier, where you can isolate um, one of these Python calls. So after each GAMS solve year, you'll have a, a call to Augur with the year. Um, basically the uh, next year and then the current year and then the name of the scenario. So I maybe start from this, but also add a breakpoint into the Python script somewhere, you know, where I, based on this. Now here, the error seems to be uh, occurring in C1 existing curtailment. Um, but if you go there, basically what gets revealed is that uh, Osprey, which is the kind of step before this, didn't run correctly. Um, and you can kind of tell if you look at uh, this, uh, you've got this execution error saying infinity times zero is undefined. So there was a problem in Osprey. It didn't run correctly, which meant that the outputs from Osprey weren't there, which meant that downstream later, the code failed. So at this point, we've now tagged it to something here. And this was basically a flag that one of the inputs going into Osprey was wrong. Um, so from there, I kind of added more breakpoints upstream of Osprey to go check where that might be. Um, as Stuart mentioned, Augur is a pretty complicated piece of code. Um, there is basically a separate model for inputs where you can trace a lot of the input data and then places where that gets processed. So uh, from that point, I uh, basically tried to trace like which of these inputs was wrong. And here, another place that Stuart pointed out that I think is useful is to look at um, some of the Augur inputs. Um, so in this Augur data file, uh, you have, for instance, the Osprey inputs. Oh, this doesn't open. You can open this in um, GAMS, but I. I guess I won't do that here, but basically I flagged in this some issues with bad values um, and was able to trace that back to the read statement. So what was happening is there was negative gas prices uh, in here. Um, they were listed as negative infinity. Um, so that's clearly wrong. Um, and from that, uh, well, I guess I can open this file. Uh, might just need to reshare the screen. Um, So here's the Osprey inputs. Um, and I think it was in gen cost. You see there's these uh, negative infinity values for natural gas prices. So Augur is not going to know how to handle that, or GAMS is not going to know how to handle that. It's going to not know what to do with multiplying negative infinity times another number. Um, but to trace this, right? So this is the gen cost variable in Augur. Um, and then I'm gonna basically can trace that back by going back to this inputs script 
um, which is where a lot of the inputs are categorized. So um, this is kind of a mapping with input name in Augur and then kind of where it's coming from in the reads model. And if I look at, uh, I guess actually it's not named the same thing here, um, but it ends up being, I think rep gas price. And that's not it. There it is. Um, so NG price, natural gas price, uh, basically ties to this in the reads model. Um, so you could search for it here, for instance, to try to trace it down. But um, this file, D3 Augur data dump, is basically where pretty much all of the data that is needed by Augur from reads is collected and, and calculated. Um, and so here we can see that where this is getting calculated. Um, and so can kind of scroll through here. And basically the, the punchline is that um, it was running a decarbonized case. So you wanted to get to zero carbon by 2050, it was also using the dynamic supply curves for natural gas, which means that the less gas you use uh, affects the price. Like if you, if there's less demand for gas, the price would go down. Um, but this model involves uh, dividing by the amount of gas used. So if no gas is used, you have division by zero and that, that causes an infinity value to show up. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the overview of kind of how I thought through this process and traced down this error. As Stuart said, I think Augur is probably some of the trickiest set of errors because usually you have to kind of go several levels upstream to figure out where it is, but often you have to kind of follow that trail of breadcrumbs to get to the variable you're actually interested in. Yeah, I mean, I will say that if you're adding technologies, there's not a, there's a pretty non-zero chance that Augur wouldn't necessarily know how to handle those technologies, depending on what they are, especially if they're like a storage technology or something. So definitely something to keep an eye out for if you're doing technology additions. I mean, you can also turn off Augur if you don't want that and don't want to deal with it. Like you can set the Augur start year to 2050 or beyond and it, it won't actually run, you know, but that it, it is something that we, we think does make a lot of improvements on how variable renewables are in storage are characterized. That was it for my demo, unless folks have questions on this. <laughs>